Hi everybody, this is Pastor Jeff Noble of Four Winds Church. I'm so excited that you've chosen to look at our video today. I hope you'll listen to the Word of God. I hope you'll read the Word of God. And I hope you'll be encouraged by the Word of God. Thanks so much for tuning in and God bless. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, well, hello again, church. Uh, if you have your copy of God's Word, we are going to be reading out of John chapter 5. John chapter 5. While you're looking that up, if you're new, my name is Pastor Harry. I'm the associate pastor here. You're going to hear a message from our founding and senior pastor, Pastor Jeff Noble. On your way in, on your seat, there was a bulletin. If you open that up, you'll see there's some sermon notes. You can follow along as Pastor Jeff is preaching, fill in the blanks. Uh, but you'll also see that there's a welcome card in there. We'd love for you to fill that out. You can put it into the offering plate when we get to that part of our service. It's just our way of getting to know you. We'd like to know your name, pray for you and your family, and welcome you here at Four Winds. Thank you to those who are watching online, and thank you to those who are listening to our radio broadcast. Let's get to our text. This is, again, John chapter 5. It says this. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now, there is, in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which, in Aramaic, is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five colored or excuse me, five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie. The blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Thank you, Brother Harry. Thank you, Ben. Thank, I mean, I, I, I could sit here for an hour and just thank everybody that was involved to make this thing happen. We actually, give you a little bit of background. We did this last year. Um, and we did it in October because everyone's saying, it wasn't as hot last time. We did it in October. So, I mean, that was part of the issue. We actually had heaters that were pumping heat in this place. It was so cold in here. But anyway, uh, but we didn't think it was going to be quite as hot today. But God blessed us with a beautiful day. That's what we asked for, and he gave us that. Amen. But I wanted to also let you know is that Four Winds has three services each week. We have a 6 o'clock service on Saturday night, and some of you go to that. We have an 8.30 service on Sunday morning, and some of you go to that, though I know a lot of you like to sleep in. And then we have an 11 o'clock service. Now, you've already had a taste of some of the music that we use, because like on Saturday night, we do a blended service. We have a little bit of praise and worship and a little bit of hymns. On Sunday morning at 8.30, we have all hymns. That's why Bernice threw in that organ thing there. My little Lutheran redhead over there. I love you, girl. <laughs> and uh, amen, glory, hallelujah. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then the 11 o'clock service, again, kind of a blended service. We have praise music. We also have some hymns. We do a little bit of everything. So, and that's why we wanted to incorporate everything into this service. We'll have some more music at the end of, end of the message here today. But, but it's just cool how God has assembled Basically, three congregations in one building. And the only reason that we have those is because we don't have enough room in our building to house everybody. We minister to over 300 people every weekend here at Four Winds Church. Matter of fact, there are 300 chairs. Yeah, amen. Amen. There are 300 chairs in this facility right now. And you see there aren't that many left over. So we've got a good turnout here today. Very exciting. Uh, but we're praying for a new facility. So join us with that. But we put a stipulation on God. Not that we can't do that. God said... If you don't, you don't get because you don't ask. So we're going to ask. And we're asking for a facility within about three miles of this location. And so be praying specifically for that. Because the Bible says pray for specifics. So that's what we're doing. We're grateful for what we have and we're very thankful. But we would love to get everyone together on a regular basis rather than just twice a year. We will do this again in the fall. Just so you know. We won't wait till October so it's so cold. But we are going to have another event like this in the fall. So be praying about that as well. But I'm so excited that you all are here the fact that we can get together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, open His Word, not have to worry about somebody coming in and kicking in the door or coming in here and arresting us. We still have that freedom, and as long as we have that freedom, or even after we have, don't have that freedom anymore, we're going to continue to preach the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Amen, amen, amen. So you're in the book of John. John is the fourth book in the Bible. If you got your Bible here today, throw that thing up there. I want to see him. I want to see him. There you go. Look at all them. Look at all them swords right there. Amen. Glory. Hallelujah. That is perfect. 
We always encourage you, every time you walk into, into, into the church, you want to bring your, 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 your Word of God. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, that's the sword. That's the thing that you go on the offensive with. So when knuckleheads are out there telling that they should, should let little six-year-old kids turn into you know, a fire truck or something like that, you say, no, 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 the Word of God says this. And so we need to stand on that precious Word. But anyway, I'm going to ask you to kind of follow along in your, word of, uh, your copy of God's Word. John is a cool book. Uh, John is a little different. The Gospels, the first four books of the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, John is a little more unique. And if I was to pick out a theme verse out of John, it would be John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, where it says, Jesus did many miraculous signs in the presence of His disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these were written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. The Bible would tell us that not everything that Jesus did was recorded on there, in there. Not all the miracles, not all the things that He said, but what He wanted us to have they wrote it down and they gave it to us in the Word of God. We preached a couple of weeks ago about the importance of the Bible. Why believe the Bible? We believe it's inerrant. That means it's without error in its original text. We believe it is infallible. That means it will not fail you when you read it and make it a part of your life. As a matter of fact, when you walk into our building right there on the right-hand side, on the outside of the building, our mission statement is God, love, and Bible. Bible, absolutely. So I just wanted to share that with the folks. But these were written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Savior. So we're going to look at one of those miracles today. Now, I believe that God still does miracles. Some of you can testify to that as well. Amen? Amen. By all means. But in this particular case, Jesus, this is the third miracle that He actually does. We see in chapter 2, that Jesus turned water into wine. I had one guy tell me one time, I said, man, I'm, I really like that miracle right there. I said, no, no, we're not going to do that, brother. But anyway, he also uh, healed an official son. This guy was sick and, and dying, and, and Jesus healed him in chapter 4. But here we've got the third miracle he does, and it's commonly referred to the healing at the pool of Bethsaida, or your Bible says Bethesda. My Bible here says Bethesda. Some of your Bibles say something different. It doesn't make any difference. The important part is, is that it is a place. Bethesda mean, is a Greek transliteration of the word meaning house of outpouring. Some translate it as a house of mercy or house of pity or house of grace. And that is where this story takes place. Now, it's not just a story. It is a recording of an actual event that Jesus did with a man. And as you heard Brother Harry speak, that man had been a paralytic for 38 years. Anybody in here 38 years old? Yeah, I know. Anyone here 104? Go ahead. Yeah, there we go. We got more hands on that one than we did 38, okay? Think about that. Been paralyzed that long. And what the people would do at this particular time is they would bring their loved ones to this pool, this area, this location, and it was believed that the water would bubble up every once in a while, and whoever was the first one to get into that pool would be healed of their disease. Well, this guy had been coming for 38 years. He was a paralytic, couldn't walk, and he was there by the pool, and Jesus shows up. Jesus shows up because he wanted to minister to this guy, but also testify to the power and glory of God. Can I tell you something this morning, church? God wants to meet with us here today. And he wants to show his power in our lives as well. And so I hope and pray that that is your heart here as well. Come, Lord Jesus. Change me from the inside out and let me leave out of here different than when I walked in the door. But before we go any further, would you join me in a word of prayer and ask God's blessing on this message? Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit. God, we want so much to be moved by your Spirit and encouraged by your Word. God, empty our hearts of ourselves. Don't let us think about the heat. Don't let us think about you know what i got to do this afternoon. Don't let us think about any of that kind of stuff, even though I mentioned it. God, wipe that away right now. 
And let us stand in your glory and in your honor, for your glory and for your honor here this morning. We give you all the praise for it in Jesus' holy name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So let's look at our text here today. Number one on your outline, if you're going to follow through, we'd encourage you. Jesus went to hurting people. Look what the text says in verse 1 through 3. Jesus went to a place up to Jerusalem to one of the Jewish festivals. We don't know what that Jewish festival was. Possibly the Passover. We're really not sure. A lot of different feasts might have been there. Doesn't make any difference. There was an event that was going on there for the Jewish people. And Jesus says, that's where I need to go. And that's where I need to be there at that particular time. And it says, and now there were, there were in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate. And some say, what's the Sheep Gate? It was a gate on the north wall where the animals that were being brought in to be sacrificed would have been put together and all that. That's just a location thing. For people so they would know exactly where Jesus was showing up. And the Bible says, he says uh, there in Aramaic called Beth Bethesda or Bethsaida. And which was surrounded by five colonnades, five structures around there. Kind of look, uh, uh, surrounded it. And a great number of disabled people used to lie there. The blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. Now the first thing I want to point out to you in your outline. When Jesus goes to hurting people, he went to those people that were disabled. And, and that's not a criticism, that's just the condition. These people had were unable to walk. They were unable to see. They were unable to get around. They were paralyzed and they could not function the way the rest of society functioned. That's where Jesus showed up. Can I tell you something? There's some sitting in this room right now and some that are watching online, some that are listening on the radio that are in the same condition. They are lame in the fact that they don't realize the power that God has available for them to walk in each and every day. If you've been coming to Four Winds Church, if there's one thing we believe, we believe in the power of God. Amen? Amen. By all means. And not only that, some folks are lame. They just, they just can't. I'm not talking lame like, oh, you're a dork, man, that kind of thing. I'm talking about just unable to get around and navigate the craziness of this world. They see something on the news and all of a sudden they go into this massive depression, that kind of stuff. He said, the fact is that some folks are indeed lame, but also some folks are blind. Blind to what? Blind to what God wants us to see. Do you realize that Christians have a different view of the world? We look at things through the blood of Christ. You say, how in the world do y'all do that? I get blood in my eyes, man. I can't see anything. The blood of Christ covers us, forgives us of our sins, cleanses us from all unrighteousness, the Bible says. And then when we see something going on, we see that it's in agreement with what God says in His Word. That's why when I see something on the news or I hear something at a school board meeting or something like that, I can look to the Word of God and say, wait a minute, what they believe is wrong. But they don't know that it's wrong because they're blind. You see, we got to open our eyes, folks. Not only do we open our eyes, we also got to open our mouths. And some folks are paralyzed. Some folks are paralyzed spiritually. They have no ability to, 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 to look at the situation and be able to handle it. That first thing, something happens in their life, they're ready to absolutely implode. We had a dear sister who came to me just a few weeks ago. Or I guess it was last week, actually. She says, Pastor, it's been a bad week. She said, uh, somebody got in and hacked my bank account and took all my money. Took it off. Took it off. And, uh, but she came in this morning and she said, praise God, I got it all back. You know? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so that, that's exciting stuff. And we see stuff like that all the time. But we'll let the circumstances around us paralyze us. You see, that's why Jesus shows up to these kind of places. Because He knows that we struggle. And then He says, I've come here to fix your situation. He went where the disabled people were. Now, the disciples were not necessarily known. The guy, the 12 guys that followed Jesus were not necessarily known for their, 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 uh, their compassion, okay? Bunch of different guys all gathered together trying to learn from Jesus. And they're walking one day in John chapter 9, verse 2 and 3. They're walking down the road, and there's a guy that had been born blind. He'd been blind his whole life. And they would normally sit on the side of the road and they would just beg for money as folks were coming by. Well, the compassionate disciples come walking by. I'm going to use Chris as an example here since you had the guts to sit in the front row, my brother. Chris, you wait? Good. Yeah, good. Just wait. Good. All right. Okay, that's okay. That's okay. So anyway... Uh, I, uh, my dear brother, let's say Chris is the one that's sitting there and he's begging for it. And they come walking by 
And they turned to Jesus and they said, Who sinned that this man should be born blind? Him or his parents? You see, the Jewish people believe that a lot of times things happen in your life because of the sin in your life. You might remember Job. Job had everything and lost it all. And his, his brothers or his friends sat around there and said, Job, you obviously did something to tick God off. You know, that's a fallacy that folks utilize. They think somehow God's punishing them by the circumstances. No, everything that happens in our life, we looked at this in Romans chapter 8 last week, everything that happens is for our good and what? For His glory. So they say, who sinned, this man or his parents? And of course, Jesus comes back and He says, neither this man nor his parents sin. In other words, squash that Jewish belief there. He said, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. You see, this circumstance is this guy lived with. And some folks would say, well, it sounds like it's kind of mean that God would let him deal with that. He was going to be completely different after Christ caught a hold of him, right? After God changed him from the inside out. He was going to Get up there and be able to walk around and everyone who's going to say, wait a minute, that guy used to be blind. And now he sees. You see, it seemed like a bad situation, but God was going to turn it into a blessing through Jesus Christ. He said it wasn't his sin. He said this was happening so God can be glorified. Listen, some of the things that are going on in your life are God's way of saying, let me be glorified in this. Don't be defeated. Don't be distracted. Don't be beat down to a nub. Rise up above that, like we looked at in Isaiah chapter 40 last week about on those wings like eagles. Rise up above that and understand that I'm about to use you in a mighty, mighty way. Can I get an amen? amen. By all means. Amen. Now, again, there was, it says there were various types of infirmities. There was... Uh, 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 Sorry, I'm, I'm get, can't get it. So these people were disabled, but they were also discouraged. They were discouraged. Can you imagine sitting next to a body of water that in your heart you believe was somehow going to fix you, and yet every time you headed to that thing, you could never get in first? These people were discouraged. Now, if you read in the Bible here, verse 4 if you're looking in your Bible, verse 4 does not exist in most major texts. No offense to those of you who are King James only, folks. That was added in by scribes afterwards. That is not a part of original manuscript. Because it said there was a belief that every once in a while an angel would come down and stir the waters and whoever got in would be healed and all that kind of stuff. Not in the original text. So when people read this, they go from verse 3 to verse 5. They go, wait a minute, I've got a problem with my Bible. That's not it at all. So it says in verse 5, the one who had been there had been there for 38 years, and when Jesus saw him there, he learned... He, and, and by the way, that's another issue that I have. This is where the NIV is wrong. Okay, I love the NIV. I use it to preach it. Jesus didn't learn nothing. Jesus came there. He knew what he was going to do when he got there. And so they use a bad... Not a bad word, but they use the incorrect word. Jesus knew this man was in, was in, a, in a troubled situation. And he knew, knew that this man had been in that condition for a long time. And so he asked him a simple question. Now, everybody else is discouraged. Everybody else is upset. Psalm 43, verse 5. And by the way, just so you know, normally we have two big screens back here that allow us, and i got one in the back usually that I can see, and allows you to see the words yourself. I'll try to read it in my southern language best I can, but I know you all think I speak a second language. You know, the English is my second language. But anyway, Psalm 43, verse 5. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise Him, my Savior and my God. When our heart gets all discouraged, when our heart gets all distracted, God says, put your hope in me. Put your hope in me and let me lead you through this circumstance. Let me get you through this. The psalmist tells himself to stop focusing on self and instead focus on God. Now, how do you go about doing that? And again, we talk about this on a regular basis here at Four Winds. We talk about the importance of, of meditation. Now, I'm not talking sitting in the lotus position. Oh, my one. That's not what I'm talking about. Meditation is nothing more than focused thought. Meditating on the Word of God, on the things that you see. 
We tell folks every week, take that bulletin home with you, those verses, and go back and look them up yourself. Read them yourself and meditate on them. Think about what God is trying to tell us through that Word. Through meditation, through prayer. Again, that should just be a natural thing for every believer. Is to pray, go before the throne of grace. Not to get your will done in heaven, but to see God's will done here on earth in our lives. Singing. As we're singing, this is a way in which we uh, focus on God. That's why we do this. Not for performance. We never perform in this church. We always present the Word of God through the, through the music and let folks worship God. And then through reading the Word of God. Those are all ways in which we uh, put our hope in God. We don't get discouraged. We get encouraged by the things of God. So, these folks were discouraged. So Jesus shows up, and number two on your own, Jesus witnessed to the helpless paralytic. The first thing he says to this guy is, do you want to be made well? Now we look at that and we say, what a dumb question. You know there's some folks that absolutely love glorying in their misery? They love being ticked off all the time. Those folks are toxic. Those folks will just absolutely suck the life right out of you. But in Jesus' case, why would he ask this man if he wanted to be made well? Well, it's pretty straightforward. You see, some folks back in biblical times, like I made the reference about Chris there. Anyway, I'm just kidding, brother. I'm messing with you. I'm messing with you. Okay, I'm playing with you. The whole idea was that sometimes people made their living by their infirmities. Their sickness, again, they, that guy sitting by the road when, they, when the disciples lovingly said, who sinned here, his parents, he probably was begging for money. And some folks would be okay with that, taking a few little penance, a few little you know, pieces of, of, of money just to kind of keep themselves afloat. I don't believe God wants any of us to be just kept afloat. I think He wants us to raise up. I think He wants us to walk in the fullness of God. And so this guy was there. So Jesus wanted to know, is this something you want to continue in? Do you want to continue to live in your broken state? Or do you want something else? That's a question for each one of us here today. Each one of us here today need to ask that. Do I want to keep doing what I'm doing and somehow think that God has just kind of forsaken me? Or do you want to finally surrender that thing to the Lord Jesus Christ today? Whatever it is. Maybe it's just coming to know Him as personal Lord and Savior. Some of you come from various religious backgrounds. I, I pick on Bernice. I love Bernice. She and I come from the same background. I was raised in the Lutheran church. We used to start at 11 o'clock sharp and then at 12 o'clock dull, man. That's what we used to do. Uh, it just, we just, I never heard the gospel. I never got excited in church or like that. And then all of a sudden I went to a Baptist church one day. Woo! But we didn't dance. Boy, it didn't know. Oh, my goodness. We didn't smoke and we didn't chew and we didn't run with those who did. Man, I mean, it just didn't work out that way. But, but nonetheless, but then I realized, you know, that, that God had a different plan for His church and we, we left the Baptist church and started Four Winds and God has blessed it ever since. Because again, we keep it simple about the things of God. But, uh, but anyway, uh, so He says, you want to be made well. Good question. 38 years, this debilitating a disease had infected this guy. And that was kind of my point right there. Some folks are okay with living in their sin and okay with living apart from God. You do realize the Bible says that if you don't know Christ, if you've never given your heart to Christ, that you fit into a category that the Bible calls you an enemy of God. Can you imagine saying, I can take you, God. How dumb would that be? And yet some folks think that's okay. Jesus wanted to see if this guy wanted to be changed. If something needed to be... Since his sickness had been witnessed by so many people for almost four decades, Jesus was about to do a miracle in his life. And what was going to happen after that? He was going to be able to testify to how he had been changed by a man he didn't even know whose name it was, but how he was able to get up. So Jesus inquired of him. Jesus saw the multitude, and yet in His sovereignty, He had, for no particular reason whatsoever, He honed in on this one guy. 
This one guy had been there 38 years. We don't know how the rest of the folks had been there, but this guy had been there for a long time. Been in that condition for 38 years. He chose that one to be healed. Now, some folks will say stuff like this. Well, how come he just doesn't heal everybody? That's a good question. Maybe you can take it up with God one day. But the fact is, is that when he does heal, he heals for a reason. And when he doesn't heal... He does that for a reason as well. Some of you are dealing with cancer. and Some of you are dealing with, with health issues right now. Uh, friends, I, I would, I, we pray on a regular basis for folks to be healed. And some folks have been healed and some folks are not. But the Bible tells us that regardless of the outcome of that situation, it's still an opportunity to glorify God. We've got to get that in our heads, man. Jesus comes here. And this has given us a beautiful picture of salvation that we were chosen in Him. Not because of anything we've done, but just because of His wonderful grace. Amen. One author said this, Grace is kindness given to those who are undeserving. For some reason, God calls us to Himself and cleanses us from all of our sin and allows us, allows us to walk in a whole different way of life. What a blessing, what a joy. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. By now, you probably figured out we like the Bible around here. Ephesians chapter three, chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And then he says this. For He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. You ever thought about that? When God saved you, He had planned on doing that before you ever were even a twinkle in your parents' eyes. I said that in church, didn't I? Oh my goodness. Think about that. That's what the Bible says. He chose us out of love. He inquired of this man, why did He ask me to want to be healed? Again, I just told you about that. He wanted to see what was in that guy's heart. Do you want to be made well? But he also wanted the man to, under, or to admit his helplessness and the desperate need for healing. You see, that's where we're at right now. we got to realize that we need a Savior. we got to realize that we are in desperate need. And that's what Jesus said. So how does this guy respond in verse 7? It says this. He says, Sir... He said, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get, someone else gets down ahead of me. What was he doing there? Making excuses. He was making excuses. You know anybody that likes to make excuses about their situation? Yeah. Well, if I just had a better job, or if I just had a bigger house, or if I just had this, or I had... And man, just whine, 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 whine. Sounds like Michigan State people. <laughs> Yeah, I'll get emails on that one. The Bible would tell us. What's that? that? They don't whine? They don't whine? I don't know. Last season's record kind of, I heard a lot of complaining about that. But listen, the admitting to the fact that there's a need there is the same thing with salvation. You gotta realize you got a need. The Lord knows our condition. He knows we're desperate to be saved. Now, some of us are saved, some of us are not. That, this is the thing I want you to get. And I, I know I know you, you hear this from me all the time, but there's new folks here. I want you to hear this because I may not ever get the opportunity to talk to you again. I hope I do. Hope you come back and hang out with us again. But the fact is, until you have that assurance of eternal life. In Christ Jesus. And it's just taking that step of faith. Until you have that, my friend, you are lost. You are separate from God. And you're not going to schmooze your way into heaven. I had a guy tell me one time, that was the stupidest thing I ever heard. He said, well, when I get in front of God, I'm just going to tell him, well, I did this and I did that. And you know what he's going to say to you? He's not even going to entertain that conversation. He says, go away. I never knew you. Well, that's not the loving God I know of the Bible. No, he's also just. And He's given opportunity. He's given you an opportunity today to recognize the situation that you're in and repent of that and turn to Him through faith and be changed. Be changed just like this guy's going to experience in just a second. 
Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10 says, If we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart God raised Him from the dead, we will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. That is Romans 10, 9 and 10. We call that Romans TNT, 10, 9 and 10. It's dynamite right there. That is the key to what Christ is trying to say. This, this guy gave all kinds of excuses. Why he's still saying, no one will help me. No one will. It's just a terrible situation. Wah, 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 wah. And Jesus doesn't, and I, I wish we could have heard the rest of the conversation. Because I, I, you know, I almost would have thought Jesus would have walked up to him and says, that's not what I said. That's not what I asked you. You know, you ever have anybody like that, like, like your kids? <laughs> did you do this? Why? That's not what I asked you. Did you do it? Yes or no? I wish we could have heard the rest of the conversation. We didn't have that. So Jesus instructs him. That's the letter B on your outline there. So just so we're up to speed here, Jesus uh, witnessed to the helpless paralytic. He inquired of him, letter A, and then he instructs him in letter B there. Look what he says. Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Now this guy probably thought Jesus was crazy. But the Bible tells us that Jesus does this stuff to get the attention of the individual and also to show the folks around the power of God. Matthew chapter 8, verse 2 and 3, there was a man with leprosy that came and knelt down before Jesus. He, she, he said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus reached out and he said, I am willing. He said, be clean. And the Bible says immediately, the man was cured of his leprosy. Christ still does that stuff. You know where I think the hang up is? Us. We believe that he can do it. Up to a point. And the fact is, we have to have undying faith. We pray for healing. We pray for marriages to be re restored. We pray for, uh, for uh, lives that, uh, uh, you know, uh, just on. The list goes on and on. We've got a prayer list here at the church. If you come, you'll see that. And we pray believing. Believing that God can do the miraculous still. But I think sometimes we just say, yeah, God, I believe that you can do that until you don't do it and I don't believe anymore. I had a lady one time many years ago. She had a husband who was from England and he hated God, was not interested in God. And she tried, she tried to witness to him and try to reach him for the Lord. Never would, never would, never would. And she would always ask the church to pray for him and we would pray for him and pray for him. And, I, and one day she walked into the church and she said, my husband gave his heart to Christ. Now he was sick. He was, he was just like, you know, near the end. And six weeks later he died. Can I tell you something, church? Don't wait. Don't wait until you think you're circling the bowl. Okay? Because you may not have that opportunity. The number of people that I've seen through the years that were here one minute and gone the next. And they'll ask me, they'll say, so what, uh, what was that personal spiritual condition? I said, I can't tell you. I can't tell you. Standing at a funeral and people will come up to me with tears in their eyes and please, they'll say, please tell me that my loved one is in heaven. Never had any interest in spiritual things. Never had any, any idea. Never, never darkened the door of a church. No, and I'm not saying that being in a church will save you. Sitting in a church won't, it doesn't make you any more saved than sitting in the garage. It makes you a Chevrolet. I mean, that's just crazy, okay? But the fact is that don't come to the end of life and say, well, I never had any interest in spiritual things, never had any interest in the church, never read the Bible. Never. I can always tell when I ask a family, I say, so, so what was their favorite Bible verse? Duh. Tell your family this. Amen. And then they come to the funeral and they'll look at me with tears in their eyes. I got another one on, the, on, on Tuesday and I'm, I'm praying the guy knows Christ. But, but they ask me, so, well, please tell me my loved ones in heaven. I can't. I can't. I have no way of knowing that. That's why Jesus said, or that's what the Bible says, today is the day of salvation. I hope you're praying for the person on either side of you right now. I hope you're praying for them by name and in the name of Jesus. I don't know their name. You should have met them during the greeting time. Anyway, let me get back to this. The Bible says, as soon as Jesus says, I'm willing, he was immediately, uh, immediately cured. What do I know about this text? 
First of all, he says, I want you to get up. In other words, toss your burdens aside. What was the burden? His legs. His legs didn't work. He could not get around. Toss your burden aside. Jesus never tells us to do something without giving us the resources to accomplish it. I'm getting more and more calls from folks. Pastor, can I come by and talk to you? I've got a situation. I got a Great, wonderful. Come on by. Don't come to me and say, I got a problem, and I give you what the Word of God says, and you go, I don't want to do that. You're wasting your time, you're wasting my time. Jesus says, toss the burden. He says, get up. Now, this guy was going to have to take a step of faith, right? He'd been there forever. But he was going to have to take that step of faith. Toss that burden. But he also says this, pick up your mat. In other words, toss your burden, but also take your bed. The mat was an indication of his sickness. The mat was an item that they used to transport him from wherever he lived to this pool at Bethsaida or Bethesda, regardless of what you're reading there. And Jesus says, not only do I want you to get up with your body, but I want you to carry the very thing that carried you as a testimony to my goodness. Can you think about that? How many folks, I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, but many of you have come to me and said, Pastor, I was addicted to alcohol. I was addicted to drugs. I was addicted to pornography. And God released me from that. Amen. That is picking up your mat. The man had to take a step of faith, tossing the burden, but then taking up the bed. This bed was going to be a testimony to everyone he came in contact with. And then the final thing he says, tell your blessings. Look what it says. I says, I want you to get up. I want you to pick up your mat and walk. Now, what do you think the people in the community thought? What do you think folks thought? They knew who he was. 38 years. And all of a sudden, they're there doing something like this. All of a sudden, they look up and they say, what in the world? What, 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 what happened? Look, well, look what it takes. Let me get back to this. What does the Bible say in verse 9? At once, and that word is euthus. I used to use that with my kids. I said, get in the house, euthus. Get in there right now. Okay? You can use that. Free of charge. Anyway. At once, the man was cured. And what did he do? He picked up his mat, and he walked. And the Bible tells us, goes on there, the rest of verse 9, it says, the day on which this took place was the Sabbath. Now, the religious guys get all ticked off, right? The religious guys, the Pharisees and all that kind of stuff, because it was against the Jewish law to do any kind of physical work or anything like that on the Sabbath. So look what it says here. This was on the day of the Sabbath. And verse 10, And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, who had been healed, say that with me, who had been healed. They said to the man, what does he say? He said, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. <laughs> Hello, Captain Obvious. The man's been there for how many years? 38 years. He's walking. <laughs> many years ago, I was in a church, and uh, I was preaching, and and we had a, a, a cool youth group. We had a lot of youth kids. But, I mean, we, we had a lot of kids come in from outside the church. So they didn't know all the churchy stuff. And, and uh, some of these kids would come in and they'd be wearing their ball caps. And they'd be wearing them all sideways. Which I never understood that one. Where the thing sideways or backwards. All stuff. And I had one of these, you know, seasoned sour saints come walk up to me. Pastor Jeff, did you see that those young people are wearing hats in the church? Now... I'm not, I understand those of you who are in the military, man, I get it. I take my hat off when I, I, mean, I wasn't in the military, but I take my hat off when I get in the building. That's just out of respect. And I know that's what you guys were taught. But I looked at this man and I said, brother, look, they're here. They're here. And they're hearing the gospel. I lovingly went on to say, I'd love for your kids to be here. Now, again... PJ isn't always the most tactful sometimes, okay? <laughs> but that's the point. These kids were here. They were hearing the gospel. They were excited about being in church. And Mr. Saxophone Face there, got a face as long as a saxophone, all like he'd been sucking on persimmons all morning, was upset 
about a hat. Sometimes we miss the big picture. It's illegal for you to be. The, the law says you can't do that. And look what the guy says. I love this. I love this. This guy's so cool. He didn't have any Sunday school training. He wasn't baptized in the church. You know, he hadn't been through a, all kinds of classes and theological background. No, 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 no. He said, let me tell you what I know. And that's all God asked us to do. As a child of God, that's all he's saying. Just tell what you know. I'll have people say this one. Well, I'm afraid to share my faith because if I share my faith, I might say the wrong. How are you going to say the wrong thing about Jesus? You were this way. He saved you. Now you're this way. And he did it all. Yeah. Look what he says in verse 11. The man who made me well said... <laughs> The religious guys are saying, wait a minute, the law says this. There's the rules of the church. There's a rule. I, folks will talk to me and say, well, yeah, well, we're drinking coffee in the church. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of having snacks and stuff in the church, but it is what it is, okay? I'd much rather come here and drink coffee than sit down at the restaurant and drink coffee and miss church, okay? But if you, if you spill it, though, would you clean it up? That's the only thing. I walk around that church sometimes, look like a dog's been let loose in there. Man, spot here, spot there, spot there. But anyway, but, but uh, the whole idea was, uh, he uh, was hearing the message and all he told was what he knew. That's it. He, he, says, he says, the man that made me well. They were all upset about the rules. And this guy was standing on his own two feet. And his only defense was, this guy came and he told me to get up and I did. He made me well. How many of us can testify to that? What, six of us? Give me a break. Come on now. Let's give a little testimony here. I got about 8,000 watts of speaker here. I want to be using that thing. I'm loving this sound system, by the way. I know, I know y'all have lost about half your hair here on this little speaker here and this over here. But, but man, I'm telling you what. I might go on for another hour. Oh, no, 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 no. Hey, I'm kidding. I'm joking. <laughs> Not a good thing for an elder to say. Anyway, pick up your mat and walk. He says, that's what the guy told me. He says, pick up your mat and walk. Once the guy was healed, Jesus says, I want you to get going. And that's exactly what the guy did. The guy that made me well. He told me to get up, pick up my mat and walk. And so that is what I did. So they ask him, who is this fellow who told you to pick up and walk? And look how the man responds again, verse 13. The man who healed, the man who... The man who was healed had no idea. For Jesus had slipped away in the crowd and was there. Which brings me to my third point of my outline here. Jesus warned the healed proclaimer. You didn't even know he was a proclaimer yet, but look what he's going to do. He's telling them, that man made me well. I'm doing what he says. Y'all can be religious and all that kind of stuff. I'm going to do what that guy gets. He made me well. You haven't done anything. He made me well. So it goes on and says, he says, it says this, so Jesus warns us. Once Jesus fixes us, listen, once Jesus fixes us, he is not finished with us. He didn't just send this guy and say, okay, go be well. No, no, he was going to testify. He was going to testify. Remember the woman at the well, that story of the woman at the well? Jesus shows up, this Samaritan woman is there at the well. She's there at the middle of the day. Nobody was around because nobody liked her. She was a woman of ill repute and, and she'd done things and nobody liked her. So she went in the, in the heat of the day. And Jesus shows up there and begins to talk to her. And when she came to realize who Jesus was, the Bible says she went back and told what? Everybody. What had happened to her? She said, this man knows everything about me. He warns the healed proclaimer. Once he fixes us, he's not finished with us. Although there's not an evidence that this healed man ever trusted in Christ as Lord and Savior, he was still willing to publicly praise Jesus for the good health in spite of the religious ridicule. What did he do? The Bible says he went into the temple. Probably to worship. Look what the text says. The man who was healed had no idea. Jesus had slipped away in the crowd. Verse 14 Later, Jesus found him in the temple. Well, wouldn't you go to church if God had done something amazing in your life? Then why don't we go before? Why don't we go before? Why don't we walk in the, in, 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 why don't we walk in the church each Sunday and say, Lord, I want first of all, thank you for the fact I've got two legs that I can actually walk in here on. 
And God, I want to thank you for the fact that I've got people around me that say that, that, that they say and they show that they love me. That I'm included, that I'm not excluded. I hope you felt the love of Christ when you came here today. And God, I want to thank you for the fact that, that you've established this church in the middle of Livonia. Why not come before? Again, this is not a sales pitch for church. You do what you want to do. But the fact of the matter is, I love coming in every week and praising God for all the things that I've enjoyed last week and anticipating what was going to happen this week. I could get hit by a truck tomorrow and I wouldn't have any regrets. Look what Jesus says. He finds him in the temple. Letter A on your outline. He, re- he says, I want, to, I want you to recognize yourself. I want you to recognize. Look what he says. See, you are well Again, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Ouch. What was he saying there? Listen, there are a lot worse things than being sick. There are a lot worse things than being poor. There are a lot worse things than being alone. And that's what Jesus was saying. He said, you've been given a precious, wonderful gift. Recognize that in yourself. Recognize what I have done for you, man who was by a pool for 38 years. Recognize yourself. Psalm 66, verse 18 and 19. The Bible says, if I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God has surely listened and heard my voice in prayer. If I'd have continued to be all mopey and bummed and, and, and ticked off about life, if I'd been that whiner and all that kind of stuff, the Bible says you're not going to get through to God. But when you find to humble yourself before Him and come into, into His presence through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ, the Bible says He hears those prayers and responds accordingly. He said, I want you to recognize yourself. You have been made well again. Then He says this, let her be on your outline. Repent of your sins. He said, stop sinning. Now some folks will say stuff like this. Well, pastor, you've told us that sin is an ongoing struggle. Sure it is. That's why the blood of Christ is so essential for forgiving us of all of our sins. I still struggle with sin and you still struggle with sin too. Problem is, I don't celebrate it. I don't gravitate to it. I don't want to continue practicing those things. Even the Apostle Paul says, man, he says, it's such a frustrating thing. He says, the things I want to do, I can't do those things. But He says, the things I want to do for glorifying God, those things I don't seem to be able to do. But those things I don't want to do, the sin garbage in my life, that I continue to seem to do. We struggle with it. But Jesus was very adamant. He says, I want you to repent of your sins right here. Settle it with God. Ask for forgiveness of your sins. And repentance means to turn away from those sins and turn to God through faith. Like I said, there's a lot of worse things than being sick. And there's also a lot of things that are better than being healthy. And that is having that relationship and that assurance of Jesus Christ that if you were to breathe your last year, you would spend eternity with Him in heaven. And you would never, ever, ever want to look back. Stop sinning. From hereafter, sin no longer, uh, sin no longer, sin no more, or something worse. Christ is just speaking of eternal consequences. Something worse will happen. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. Some folks try to flip their nose at God and say, oh God, you, you know, just I just want you to be some kind of, uh, uh, you know, I just want you to be some kind of cosmic waiter up there, just taking my order and, and blessing me and keep me happy. But when I get all I want, then the heck with you and I'm going to go on about my life. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. See, that doesn't sound very happy to me. I'm not here to make you happy. I'm here to tell you the truth. I promise you we'll always do that. The person that wants to continue to live in their sin is heading toward a cliff and there is no return. But, he goes on to say, the one who sows to please the Spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit, the one that honors God through their life and, and walks in faithfulness, and by that Spirit, that's, uh, and from the Spirit, he will re- reap eternal life. Again, we don't worry about 
what the future holds because we know who holds the future. Jesus Christ. Matthew Henry said this, and I put this at the bottom of the outline. Those who are healed by God's Word should be ruled by it as well, regardless of what it costs them. Yeah, okay, you may have to get up a little bit earlier on Sunday morning to come and be with your brothers and sisters in Christ or come to Saturday night service and maybe not go to the movie that night. But I'm telling you, if you, know, if you understand what I'm talking about, and if you understand that it's not about some external thing, like this guy thought it was about the pool, when you realize that, you realize that Jesus Christ is the only answer. He's the only answer for everything. He's the only answer for this church. He's the only answer for this, this, this state, this nation, and this world. He's the only thing that can fix all this. And we've got to start putting our faith in Him. A fan, uh, I wasn't going to tell this story. I'm going to tell it nonetheless. My wife and I were out one day with our kids for dinner. And when you're in seminary, you know, and some of you know what I'm talking about as far as just finances and things. It's a struggle, it's a struggle right now. We all see it. You know, Bidenomics and all that stuff. Anyway, it's a struggle. So we're at a dinner one night and, and, and you know, we... We could afford the meal, but it was going to be tight and tough. But we had a great time. Family was together. We're enjoying this meal. And I asked the waitress for the check. And she brought the check and she said, I'm take it. And she said, you're all set. What do you mean we're all set? And I'm reaching for my wallet. She said, no, you're all set. Oh, what are you talking about? She said, somebody in the restaurant paid your bill. <laughs> Family of five. And you know when that happened? I felt really weird about that. I sat there for a while. Who would do? And then you start scoping out the room. <laughs> Who would do that? Because literally, you know, I didn't really know anybody in the room or anything like that. It was like I walked in and said, "Oh, hey, Bill, how you doing?" I can you know, I didn't see any of that. So we paid the bill. Even when we got up from the table, I felt like I wanted to do so. I felt like I, 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 I of course, I gave the waitress an extra tip, but I, I, I felt like I needed to do something. I felt like I had to contribute somehow. And the fact is, I couldn't. It would have been stupid to pay the bill a second time. Hello, duh. I'm in the car feeling guilty that I ate all the meal. I ate all the food. I enjoyed all the meal. My family was well nourished. And somebody else paid the tab. Isn't that exactly what Jesus did here? Jesus paid the tab for this guy. Healed him. Made him well. And then challenged him. Stop sinning. And verse 15 said, The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. That's the word that we have here today. Listen, some of you have a bill that you owe today. A bill you can't pay. No amount of money, no amount of effort, and your charismatic abilities are not enough. That sin tab is owed. And yet Jesus, full of grace and mercy, willingly paid for you and me when He went to that cross to die for our sins. He took your bill, the bill that you can't pay, you can owe, that you owe but can't pay, took it upon Himself. Now you can carry that bill with you for the rest of your life, and friends, I'll tell you, it'll cost you your life when it's all said and done. Or you can receive the free gift without guilt, without confusion, just by faith. Say, I want to know Jesus here today. Now, I know a lot of you hear this on a regular basis, but I figured this was our opportunity. We don't want anybody to walk away with a sin debt with a bill that they still owe. And you will. So you got a choice to make. A choice. Which will you choose? Let Jesus pick up the tab? Or somehow try to pay it off yourself, which will never work? Think about that if you would. Let's pray together. Every head, out, head bowed and every eye closed. I invite you right now to search your own hearts. 
and ask the Lord, Lord, what are you telling me here today? Are you that guy that's been, or that girl that's been laying by the pool for a long, long time waiting for something to happen? And never finding any results. Or maybe you're that religious person that just wants to keep the rules, but not have the relationship. Ask yourself. God, what is it you want for me today? And I guarantee you there's folks in here today that He is telling you today is the day to give your heart to Jesus. Father God, it's in the name of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit that we ask your blessings on this time. We pray, Father, that folks would not be afraid, not be ashamed, but they would stand up, stand up for Jesus. That they would get up. That they would pick up that mat and that they would walk in the glory of God. Father, that is my prayer here this morning, and I pray that you will do a mighty thing in these next few moments. And we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You know, I never cease to be amazed on how God is working here at Four Winds Church. We're seeing so many amazing things take place. Lives being changed, families being restored, financial situations being repaired, Bible studies changing and, and, and starting all the time. It's an amazing time to be a part of the church. If you have a church home, well, good for you. But if not, come check out Four Winds Church. We'd love to see you sometime soon. You can get information from fourwindslove.org. That's fourwindslove.org. Thanks for tuning in. God bless.